Uh, a few things before we bring Charlie out. Guys, why don't you show Matthew chapter 24. Matthew chapter 24 on the screens right now. Jesus there, Matthew chapter 24. It says in the scriptures, then Jesus went out and departed from the temple and his disciples came up to him to show him the buildings of the temple. And Jesus said to them, do you not see all these things? Assuredly, I say to you, not one stone shall be left here upon another that shall not be thrown down. And as he sat on the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him privately saying or asking three questions. Tell us, when will these things be? And what will be the sign of your coming and the end of the age or the end of the world? And Jesus answered and said to them, take heed that no one deceives you. For many will come in my name saying, I am the Christ and will deceive many. And you will hear of wars and rumors of wars. Sound familiar? Events leading up to his coming. See that you're not troubled for all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. For nation or ethnos, remarkable, isn't it? Ethnos, ethnicities will rise up against ethnicities and political realms against political realms. There will be famines, pestilence, and earthquakes in various places, and all these are the beginning of sorrows. Then they will deliver you up to tribulation and to kill you, and you will be hated by all nations for my name's sake. And then many will be offended and will betray one another and will hate one another. Then many false prophets will arise and deceive many. And, and because of lawlessness will abound, the love of many will grow cold. But he who endures to the end, the same shall be saved. And this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in all of the world as a witness to the nations. And then the end will come. Therefore, when you see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet, standing in the holy place, whoever reads, let him understand, then let those who are in Judea, note that, flee to the mountains, and let him who is on the housetops not go down to take anything out of his house, and let him who is in the field not go back to get his clothes. We're almost done. But woe to those who are pregnant in those days, pay close attention church, and to those who are nursing babies in those days, and pray that your flight or your escape may not be in the winter or on the Sabbath. This is key because Jesus is speaking to the Jewish people. For then there will be great tribulation such as not been since the beginning of the world until this time nor ever shall be. And unless those days were shortened, no flesh should be saved. But for the elect's sake, they shall be shortened. Then if anyone says to you, look, here is the Christ or there, do not believe it. For false Christs and false prophets will arise and show great signs and wonders to deceive, if possible, even the very elect. And I'll stop right there. In Matthew chapter 24, Jesus gave a 30,000 foot flyover of the events that would be bringing about the end times and a series of events. Now, the Bible tells us, and this is specifically speaking to those who live on the housetops of their roofs. You don't, but they do in Israel. You're not concerned about escaping Jerusalem on the Sabbath, but the Jews would be on the Sabbath. They can only go so far. And you don't care about escaping anywhere here in Southern California in the winter because we don't get snow. At least we're not supposed to. And then he said that when you see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet, it's a reference to the fact that in the last days, there's going to be a temple rebuilt in Jerusalem. Why is this important? Because the age in which we're going, ladies and gentlemen, they have to change for these things to come to pass. There's got to be a shift in the structure of the world in which you and I know it. And in these last couple of years... There has been more change in the governance of humanity all at once than at any other time in human history. All of us went through the pandemic issues together. And many are saying, and I agree, that we'll never return back to normal in the sense that now the world has become an entity by which things are at a fast pace. And one of those things is regarding the issue of this global uniting effort of the nations and how that's going to be. So before we go any further, I want you all to know tonight, none of this stuff 
that's being presented is here to scare you. You should have faith in the Lord Jesus Christ that he knew what he was doing when he brought you into this world at such a time like this. That it's the God of the Bible who knows the future. This God has told us that Jesus Christ died on the cross for our sins and rose again from the dead. He loves you. There's no sin so great that he cannot forgive. And that he literally has given you life. And your life is to have a purpose. But you can only find that purpose in bowing your knee as it were to him. Bowing your heart. You can bow your knee all you want. He wants your heart. And listen, he'll come in to your life and he'll take control. And he will transform your life. And for those of us who have been big, big rotten sinners before meeting Jesus, before meeting Jesus, he takes us, the big ones, and we're forgiven a lot, and so we love him much. And so there's no sin so great that he will not forgive you. But none of us are perfect. We all need him. And you need to know that he died on the cross for you and rose again from the dead. Just when you think that Charlie Kirk has reached his peak and getting information out across the United States and addressing our college campuses and reaching our culture. The next thing he does is another blockbuster in the information that is being disseminated to a culture that God is using him to wake up. And that is the young generation. And we're so excited. He's the founder and president of Turning Point USA. I don't think he needs much of a welcome here, but ladies and gentlemen, Charlie Kirk. <laughs> Love you. Great. Thank, you. Great check. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Feel at home here. What a... I love this church. Yes, you do. You better. You told me you did. He's outside. (laughs) So, Lord, we pray in Jesus' name that as we go through these things tonight, hearts would catch fire with hope. Lord, that as we see the things of this world and about this world, it's, uh, it's outdone and it's undone by the power of your word. You will have the last word. And that's the scriptures. We're living in an exciting time. Bless Charlie. Bless us tonight. All those who hear. May their lives be transformed. Because of the hope. That they'll hear about tonight. Even in the midst of this amazing moment. In world history. We ask it in Jesus name. And all God's people said. Amen. 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 Charlie where do we begin? We're talking about the great reset. Yeah I mean. First this is an intimidating topic. For a lot of people. And I have done a lot of research. And study into this for the last year, year and a half in particular. And it's intimidating because when you just read the website of the people that are trying to execute the Great Reset, you feel like you're reading a conspiracy theory. And I think that's actually part of the strategy is that they lead with the stuff that you won't even believe. And then they're able to say like, oh, it's not even a conspiracy theory because there is no way that it could actually be real. Um, And this is affecting all of our lives in more ways than one. And, you know, Jack, you and I were texting back and forth, I think, right near our Turning Point USA America Fest, right near Christmas. And I said, Jack, I really want to do something special when I come back, you know, to your amazing church. And you had the idea to talk about the Great Reset and to dive into it because it could be really complex, but it doesn't have to be. And the, the, the way I want to start, though, Jack, is to kind of frame the players that are behind this. So we've all heard the term globalists. Uh, These are people that do not believe in the sovereignty of nations. Uh, These are people that don't believe in borders. They don't believe there should be any difference between America or Brazil or Sierra Leone, that the world needs to come together in a borderless society. Jack, you're going to go into depth of how the scriptures actually, you know, prophesy this uh, in amazing detail. So the globalists, they look at themselves as trying to micro-engineer your behavior, the world, your decisions, and in particular, let's just be blunt, they want to play God because they don't believe in God. And right. so we, everyone here tonight believes in two things. And you might have different politics. You might have different ways of looking at the world. We believe there is a God and you are not him. That's is that right. right? We believe those two things tonight? <laughs> Good start. That's a nice starting yeah, point, absolutely. right? absolutely. At the World Economic Forum, the globalist setting, they believe 
neither of those things. That's right. They do not believe there is a God, and they believe if there was a God, it's me, titan of industry, Jeff Bezos, Hollywood actor, head of state. So that's a huge difference, right? So we start from a philosophical approach of one of humility and one that is waiting for God's grace to come down to us. They look at one as one of will. I am going to make the world as I want it, and I am going to be in charge. And that really is a satanic and good versus evil struggle that we see from the very beginning of the Bible. So this convenes actually in a place. So every winter, uh, the richest people on the planet, heads of state, actors, they meet in Switzerland in a town called Davos. You've probably heard of this before. Uh, usually they'll do kind of market commentary from Davos, Switzerland, uh, right near the border of Liechtenstein, really nice you know, beautiful area if you guys ever visit it. Um, less important about where it is, but more important what actually happens there. Um, for the last couple of years, they've really become more and more organized and they've become more vocal and more clear about the world that they are trying to usher in. Um, and they were kind of always struggling and wrestling. You go back to look at the tapes of 2017, 2018, 2019, before the Chinese coronavirus, they were really, they were unable to make the argument of the bridge. So they knew where we were, and they knew where they wanted to go, but they were always stopping short of how to get there. Because they're like, huh, Western society is super rich and prosperous and has private property rights and has borders. How are we actually going to connect the two of them? So the man who is the chairman of the World Economic Forum is an individual by the name of Klaus Schwab. So if you are like in central casting of a Hollywood film, Bond villain, this is Klaus Schwab. Let's it's put a picture true. of Klaus Schwab up on the screen, by the way. Have you ever seen the recent James Bond film of Blowfoot? Th that's Klaus Schwab, right? No, it gets better. So um, he also talks in this like super baritone he German does. accent. And I think we have a video of Klaus Schwab really quick, just to get an idea of kind of who you're dealing with here, really quick. When I mention our names, like Mrs. Merkel, um, even uh, Vladimir Putin and so on, they all have been young global leaders of the World Economic Forum. Mm -hmm. But um, what we are very proud of now is the young generation, like uh, Prime Minister Trudeau, um, President of, Brazil, of uh, Argentina and so on, that we penetrate the cabinets. So yesterday I was at a, at a reception for Prime Minister Trudeau and mm. I would know that half of this cabinet or even more half of, uh, half of this cabinet are, for, are actually young global leaders of the world. Right. And that's true in Argentina. Oh, well, what is that noise? Yeah. I don't Sorry. know. That's true in Argentina as well. It's true in Argentina, and uh, it's true in France now. Mm -hmm. I'm here with the president, with the yeah, young good. global leader. Okay, you guys, so, but good. Let me translate. I know it's like this understated thing. What he's saying there, he's openly admitting, I know it could be hard to understand the you know, English-German you know, accent. He's openly admitting the World Economic Forum has taken over entire governments. That's what he was just saying. Justin Trudeau is a young World Economic Forum leader. France is that way. He's saying openly at this forum put on by the World Economic Forum, we're staffing every government in the West. That's right. So, for example, the head of finance in Canada, when they shut down the bank accounts of the truckers, World Economic Forum graduate. Justin Trudeau, World Economic Forum graduate. Emmanuel Macron, World Economic Forum graduate. All the ties go back to this individual, Klaus Schwab. So who is this guy? So he's German. You know, obviously, but that's it. Let's talk about that for a second. The German view of history mm -hmm. is the German historicist view of history, non Christian, is one that if we advance technology quick enough, we can get to a place of utopia here on earth. Uh, a, a guy by the name of Hegel wrote this back yep. in the 1800s about how we can accelerate humanity quickly. He's an engineer, actually. Klaus Schwab believes in trusting the science, if you will. Now, when they convene together, and this is the point that I, I want to kind of put forward of how the last couple of years are so instrumental, they're always plotting and planning and trying to put things in motion. So they've had these eight goals of the Great Reset. We're going to go through those tonight and actually how the Bible predicted every single one of them. And the challenge always was, how do we reset something if it's not broken? So first you have to break it. That's right. So before you actually bring in a reset, you have to smash it into a million pieces. And we have just lived through the last two years of them smashing our civilization into a million pieces. Lock everything down. Put masks on kids. 
Don't allow them to develop linguistic skills. Vaccine mandates, destroy small businesses, mm -hmm. erode the currency, create 80% of all dollar bills in circulation in the last two years. And then all of these other seemingly out of reach goals right. all of a sudden come right into view. So as we talk tonight, Klaus Schwab, World Economic Forum, Davos, we got all of our terms right. These people are, they look at themselves as the masters of the universe of the entire planet. But there's one, there's a couple things that stand in the way of the Great, great Reset, and one of those is America. They don't really know what to do with America exactly yet, right. and it's a perfect segue to our conversation tonight. You guys, what's amazing about what Charlie's talking about is because as you research the development of nations and the birth of nations throughout human history, there's only two nations in the world that can boast the hand of God directly upon their founding, and one is the nation Israel, and the other is the United States which is a very remarkable thing, which is one of the reasons why we are what is known in the world as American exceptionalism is the fact that it's not that we're snooty or that we're better than anybody else. It's that we recognize that we have been recipients of a tremendous act of God that began with our pilgrim fathers. And again, I'm, I'm a big fan of the Mayflower Compact. It's a two-paragraph uh, argument, uh, declaration. It's the na in some ways, it's the nation's birth certificate, and you ought to read it. It should be read, I think, to your kids and by yourself every year. But the, the point that we're making tonight is this, is that the Bible makes the announcement that in the last days, okay, whatever that is, the last days, we do know it means that at a time when God moves, that in the last days, there's going to be a a gathering of nations from around the world that wind up ruling the world, and each of them, the Bible tells us in the book of Daniel and in the book of Revelation, that each of them have a king, and each of the ten dominate the world. So ten kings will preside over ten regions that will dominate the, princip the municipalities or, or uh, regions of power under them. And the Bible refers to this in the book of Daniel. Many people have referred in our modern tongue to the resurrection of what was the ancient Roman Empire out of the book of Daniel. It's fascinating. But the point is this. There are 10 leaders. There'll be four key speaking uh, rule makers, but out of them will arise one that will be predominant. And that one will, by intrigue, whittle away or destroy the other so that he alone is this one that dominates the economies of the world, that dominates what, what you can believe and not believe. In fact, he is the one, Charlie, that in Revelation 13 tells us that it's this guy that is going to implement a reboot or a reset of the economic uh, systems of the world by numbers. No more currency. No more currency. The Bible says in Revelation 13 that this one that is coming will implement a numerical system of transaction. And there's a prefix, by the way, to the number. So think about your phone. You've got your area code before your number, right? Well, think about the prefix. The Bible says in the book of Revelation that that prefix of your number will be a three-digit number. And it is the number 666. And he is the one, this one that is known as the Antichrist, will usher in a global dominating world economy and a world system. To us, that sounds bad. To us, that sounds horrible. To a world that has been conditioned. And that's why you and I have been talking to Charlie. I've been telling Charlie that I think the last two years, we've been going through the great setup. That's right. Before the big reset takes place. Because, like he said, America's a weird duck in the world. That's right. Be, uh, the moment it was under the leadership of Trump, our economy exploded back and, and things began to move again. Your business began to prosper. You had to hire people. This is unheard of in the world. And there's something about America that is unique. And so it's our prayer that we stand and fight and stay strong. God might show us mercy, Amen. right? He might pause the button on the things that are advancing. But we're living in the days, now we see, post-COVID world, we see how things can change now globally, overnight. And so it's quite a remarkable time. But America is that bone that is stuck in the throat of, of this globalist effort. And sad to say, is these great corporations, you know, that we've all learned to 
uh, be dependent upon, the Apples and the Microsofts of the world and Amazon. Um, I, you must admit, you almost maybe can't live without them. We're hooked on them. We don't like going shopping anymore. We like that little box at our doorstep. But all that comes at a price. It's building a kingdom. And they have an agenda. And they see themselves as lords. That's right. Charlie? Yeah, and so... As you can see in the last year, I know a lot of you are probably really confused, and it's okay, I am too, watching the current president of the United States, um, because he's equally as confused, and that's fine, but you're confused because you're saying, are you doing this intentionally? And and the answer is, of course course he is. And whether he's doing it willingly or not, and stuff, that's a separate question. The point is, the cabal around him is trying to weaken the only thing that is standing in the way of the Great Reset. Now, there are two type of great resets. We'll get into this. And the tension point is actually playing out in the Russian-Ukrainian situation of two different visions of how they want a globalist society. One through Russo-China kind of nationalism and one of no nationalism and just kind of a technological dominance. Both are bad, by the way. Let me be very clear. Both are bad. But America is a real, uh, it's an aberration. It's a country that respects individual rights. We, We have a constitution that that recognizes separation of powers and consent to the governed and an independent judiciary. It's a bottom-up system where the states created the federal government, the federal government didn't create the states. And so when these individuals, that you have to understand that they might have yachts and jets and they might have more money than they can count, but they're devoid of purpose. And this mm-hmm. does fill a purpose void That's for them. Right. It does. They get to feel really important when they get to sit in a room and they think they're doing the right thing. Now, this is an important point is that we believe what the people of Davos are doing is evil. It's obviously evil, right? But they think they're doing good. That's right. Very few people actually do what they do thinking they're doing evil. Stalin thought he was doing the best thing ever. In his private diaries, he thought that you know, famishing millions of Ukrainians was the right thing because they deserved it. The point is that they've convinced themselves that they're actually doing the thing that will benefit humanity and benefit the planet and benefit Earth. And so we're seeing this massive collision course, right? And the Great Reset, make no mistake, was severely weakened under, the, under President Trump for four years. When America's energy independent and the borders are secure wow. and the economy is vibrant and peace is breaking out in the Middle East and you don't have autocrats invading other sovereign countries and you have NATO beefing up and all of a sudden membership is increasing... All of a sudden, the Great Reset is kind of like this weird coffee shop discussion and no one takes it seriously. (laughs) When the American dollar is strengthened, when inflation was kept in check, when consumer price index was the highest ever, all of a sudden, all these kind of other ideas kind of don't make a lot of sense. But now that you're going to go pay for gas in California, and $7 gas is coming very soon. Yes. Very soon. $110 a barrel oil. Today, right? Today, $110. It's going to be be 130 in two weeks if this keeps up. If all of a sudden you try to buy a home in Phoenix, buy a home in L.A., everything's 20 or 30 percent more expensive. All of a sudden, there's going to be clamoring for what the American dollar has not done completely or totally, just reset. The dollar and the pound are the only two currencies in the last 100 years not to reset. I'm going to say that again. That is awesome. The dollar and the pound are the only two currencies in the last 100 years not to reset. What does that mean when you don't have to reset? It means no one obliterated it. No one destroyed it. So what does it mean when a currency is reset? 90% of what you own disappears immediately. That's the only way you could reset a currency. You devalue it so much. By the way, when prices go up, you're seeing your dollar become weaker in real time. Yes. As all of a sudden you go into a store and everything costs more and you have to buy less, even though you're working harder to just buy less stuff that costs more, you are experiencing the ramifications of the Great Reset. Now, you might say, well, why why do they want this? What do they want to usher in? Well, a strong American dollar as the reserve currency is one of the things that stands in the way of the global titans ushering in a one-world currency, as Jack talked about with the scriptures detail. So I just want to reiterate this, which is that the globalists a year ago, and we're we're going to kind of lace this whole conversation, hopefully with some optimism, because I know this is really heavy stuff. um, We will. No, we will. Trust me. We're going to have a lot of hope by the end of this conversation. Don't worry. Um, and I'm going to give a li- I'm going to tease you a little bit so you don't run out. Um, you're just like, just like, just zap me up, God, like I'm done. So I get it. So um, is this, which is a year ago, the globalists thought they were ahead of schedule and they were right over the mark. Now, the globalists, the World Economic Forum, they're paranoid and they're nervous and they're confused. 
Yes. And we're going to go into why. So that's a little bit of a tease, yeah. but we're going to go into why. This is so key. So I believe, I think the scripture teaches that not only the uniqueness of, of America that God has given us, but the fact that these are spiritual powers, ladies and gentlemen, that are behind all entities, all things that take place. Now, for some of you, you may not be a, a believer. You may not be familiar with the Bible. But the scriptures teach us that the things that are manifested in our physical world are manifesting because of invisible powers that are at play. And you, I know, so oh, I can't go that far. I can't go. Just, just understand this, that you don't have to believe it, but many do. And you may not believe in what they're thinking or saying, but they do. And it's very clear that there is what God has spoken in the spirit realm. And there is a spirit realm that is known as sinister and dark and demonic. And Charlie said it right at the beginning. These players view themselves as, as lords unto themselves. Right. They are not only kings, but they view themselves as king makers. And so, again, this, this thing, this bump in the road that... Uh, America is, uh, does that send a message? Uh, does it promote, does it announce that there's hope? And I want you to know that I absolutely believe that there's hope. Listen, God governs time. It's not for you and I to figure out, oh my goodness, the great reset's coming. I'm going to go, I'm go sit in the desert and wait. <laughs> Don't do that. Some people, <laughs> should I go to college? Of course not. But, yeah, but that's, that's but, a separate question. But, but live your life. Don't do that. Why would you do that? I trained you so well, Jack. Why would you do that? <laughs> but but uh, do you want to get married? Get married. That's right. Exactly right. You want to yes. have babies? Have a yes. bunch. Yes. But listen, live your life looking for Jesus. But just know this. As a believer, this world is not our home, but we fight for our freedom and liberty more than anybody else. Right? So, so, Jack, I think it would be fun to start to dive into what it. their actual goals are. Yep. So, again, I, I said earlier that part of their strategy is to list out what would otherwise be considered so extreme publicly, and then the media doesn't cover it, but you can actually still find it on their website, instead of doing it privately, because then they're, it's, so, it's, it's so unbelievable that these are the goals of the people that run the world that they think that you don't care because they put it on their website. It's the new strategy, by the way. They're, this, they're, they're trying this out. <laughs> so the first one, Jack, and you could go through what the Bible tells us about this. They, believe, so they have eight goals by 2030, okay? And they believe, and they've said this, that COVID will be the means that helps get this done. So let's just go through the first. Yep. You'll own nothing and you'll be happy by 2030. This is what Emmanuel Macron believes, Justin Trudeau, Leonardo DiCaprio, Jeff Bezos on the entire gauntlet. Number two. <laughs> the people who own stuff. The people that own stuff. Because you know why? You'll own nothing, but they will. <laughs> Number two. The United States will no longer be the world's superpower. Outward stated prediction and goal by the World Economic Forum 2030 on their website. Yep. Number three, you won't die waiting for an organ donor because you can make organs synthetically. Jack, you're going to go into what the Bible says about that. Number four seems silly, but it's actually there's a Bible verse about this. You'll eat less meat. And then the next is a billion people will be displaced by climate change. Um, the, uh, the next is you could be, pre be preparing to go to Mars. And then Western values will have been tested to their breaking point. We'll go into what Western values are. And the last one that I forgot to add on that, Jack, is the eighth. Fossil fuels will be obsolete. Yep. The entire energy, will be gr an energy grid will be green. Now, does that make sense now why all of a sudden they don't want to use American liquid and natural gas to try to weaken Putin? You see, right now in the White House, they're struggling. Instantly, right. Because they say they hate Putin. And Putin should be held accountable for what he invaded Ukraine. Scumbag for doing that. However, they don't actually want to use the one thing at the disposal That's that right. could kneecap Putin. Because they say, wait a second, we got, to get the, we got to get there by 2030. And if we go frack right now, we're not going to have no fossil fuels by 2030. It's right in front of them every day. Explain that. Explain that. Did you hear him say frack? Yes. Right? So Charlie's talking about literally right now, but it won't happen for pride and many other reasons. That's right. Right now... Joe Biden can snap his finger right. and reopen the Keystone Pipeline, yeah. and he can let the permits go now out to start fracking. Why? Because it's fracking and the Keystone, which the United States, I don't know if you know this or not, 
But for a brief period of time, the United States was the biggest number one oil producing, natural gas producing nation on the planet. That's right. We were the ones that had so much that we could sell it to other countries. So I, somewhere, somewhere in the area of natural gas that at, at 20... Uh, 18 consumption rates, we had just over 2,000 years of natural gas alone That's to right. go. But Biden shut all that stuff off. That's he right. shut it all down. And he, he claimed that it was not good for the environment. And he is so right. Right now, Vladimir Putin could be stopped dead in his That's tracks right. if we immediately released our oil and our energy uh, to the to the, Europe, rather Europe now is dependent upon Nord Stream Two. Nord Stream Russia. Two. That's right. And uh, this is a remarkable play of power. There's no doubt about it that energy is now becoming the new currency. That's right. And, yet, and look, energy used to be what civilizations worried about, you know, 100 and 150 years ago. Thanks to the development of the industrial revolution and fossil fuels, we stopped really caring about energy. But energy always used to be, besides food and water, the thing that civilizations would go to war over. Like, how do you power your civilization? How do you keep your people alive? How are you able to progress technologically? We have, we have advanced so, so far so quickly, we've become so desensitized as to be able to turn on the lights and not know what happens behind it, that we think we could just have solar panels on every roof and wind, wind farms everywhere and we're going to be just fine overnight. And so what you have in the White House is they could tomorrow say, we are not going to buy the 600,000 barrels of oil a day that we're buying from Russia. They could say to Europe, we are going to provide all the oil and natural gas that you need. By the way, Signal Hill is a huge producer of oil in, in the western part of the United States. A lot of people don't know that. But it's not one of the biggest in the country. It's like top 30. But the Permian Basin in West Texas, in southeast New Mexico, the Marcellus Shale in Pennsylvania, and in southern New York, and the Balkan Shale in North Dakota, those three deposits Huge. of LNG, liquefied natural gas, and just good old oil, or whatever it turns into fuel, is enough to power the entire world with new efficiencies for at least 75 to 100 years. And we wouldn't have to power the entire world, because obviously there's other countries that we could do deals with. How However, the point is this, they don't want that. They don't want the millions of jobs created. They don't want to become the next net exporter of energy. Why, 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 why? Well, it's because they got to go back to their goal, right? They got their training at the World Economic Forum Young, right. young World Leaders Program. And when young Emmanuel Macron or Justin Trudeau or young, young Jen Psaki or whoever is making the decisions, when they were taking the class, <laughs> was saying, they said, fossil fuels is ending civilization. Now. I don't know about you, Jack, but I don't really know if it matters solar panels versus fossil fuels if there's a nuclear holocaust. Like, I don't know if that's that important. And that's not an exaggeration. If we were to be embracing our own energy, these dictators stop immediately. Immediately. Because yep. they, they, they feel emboldened when we don't. So let me just say one more thing yeah, on this, no, though. Yeah, no, please go. Which, go. which is, we go through that list, and we can pick whichever one you want, Jack, is that I can tell you almost every single puzzling news item that you see which is like why would they be doing that this is why why are they doing this when you study it when you study the great reset on the world economic forum it doesn't take a lot of time you know i've decided to go really deep all of a sudden you'll look at the news through a completely different prism like oh so that's why they want to have two million people illegally crossing the border that's every right. year oh that's why they want the dollar to collapse that's why they say inflation is a good thing that's why all of a sudden they say that they want to have a generation of renters and not landowners that's why they want everyone to have debt so they could reset. All of a sudden, it's, it is the glasses that you put on to make the news make sense from a biblical perspective that will give you clarity and peace of mind to the otherwise cynical and puzzling news cycle. For the first time in human history, a nation shuts itself down by a handful of power brokers, not the people, and then turns around and has the idea, let's give money away and keep people from producing, keep people home, we'll pay them to stay home. And now you're not, you didn't hear this in last night's State of the Union address because you didn't watch it according to the ratings. <laughs> but if you would have watched it, you would have heard amazing things of how great America is doing and how it's going so great that you don't realize it yet. But don't worry, Ukraine. We're standing behind Iran. Yeah, that's right. Anyway, the, the, the point is, if you want to attack a country, you don't have to drop bombs on a country. That's, like the, that's when you've exhausted all other efforts. That's such a good point. You don't have to drop bombs. 
All you have to do is disrupt their economy. That's, That's the goal anyway. Disrupt their economy, enslave the people. The United States was attacked recently by itself, by its leaders, to get you connected to government handouts and, in, and plunging the nation into greater debt so that we cannot recover. All that plays into the hands of exactly what Charlie just said. It's the great reset, or at least the great setup, to bring it about. Right. And no country has ever done this before. Come on. You wouldn't do it to your kids. At some point, your kids reach an age, and you say, get out. <laughs> I love you. Give me the keys. Come back. Maybe call us first. But you're big enough now. Get out. And you don't have them stick around forever. And what we have done is create this setting whereby we're not only not going to work, we can't find people to fill jobs, and a whole generation's terrified to go outside without their mask on, even though they know it doesn't work. There's just something spiritual. Yes. You see, I'm going behind the scenes now. There's something spiritual to all this. And just know this, friends. The Bible says that Satan is the one that traffics in fear. Fear. No, it's the science. No, no, no. If you understood the science, you wouldn't be wearing the mask. Because a mask cannot stop COVID. A mask cannot stop COVID. Look, there, there's a fire uh, so in Santa, uh, Santa Ana Mountains, whatever. It has stopped dust. It has, it has stopped big particulates, but it cannot, it even says on the box that you bought your mask in, it says cannot stop viruses. <laughs> Why? We've been conditioned to be dependent upon the government by fear. Don't think for yourself. We'll take care of you. The government will see to it that you're healthy. Trust us. Yeah. By the way, where's Fauci? I know this is off topic. What? Well, it, you know, it, it is... It's not totally off topic, and this actually goes to a little bit of the teasing of the optimism that I'm not going to go all at once because I want to make sure people stay for the whole thing. Um, so, but I'll give you a little bit of a crumb, which is that um, Fauci is part of the Great Reset. He's a big part of it. Um, Fauci is, in a lot of different ways, in my personal opinion, uh, w was one of the most powerful people on the planet ever mm -hmm. to exist, and I can prove it to you. No one has ever had the power to stop the movements the breathing and the medical behavior of billions of people billions. just because he went on television to say it. I want you to think about that. <sighs> Has a human being ever had that kind of power? To be able to control your breathing because he said so. To be able to control your children's breathing at school. That kind of power is, is beyond anything the, what the ancient Romans Amazing. and Greeks would have imagined that someone on earth would be able to have. But here's the thing that, oh, and I'll get to the, you know, where Fauci is right now, because I think the answer is really instructive, but a little more background. No one ever voted for Fauci. He is, by definition, an extra-constitutional figure. No one campaigned for him. He never petitioned. He never had to be called into questions about who was financing or funding him. He was a creature of the fourth branch of government. And again, the brilliance of the Founding Fathers was trying to prevent against people like Anthony Fauci. He was unelected. That's right. Unchecked power and was largely unknown until the pandemic popped up. He was running the entire health infrastructure, which meant everything. Mm -hmm. Your breathing, your medical decisions, vaccines, your job, your employment, whether I could serve in the military, you could travel, you can go to other countries. All of it was straight through him. And it was really brilliant when you think about it from the Great Reset crowd because they were not able to get the Great Reset in just through talking about BLM and CRT. That's part of it. We'll get into it. Mm -hmm. They weren't able to get it in just by turning men against women like the Me Too movement. No, no, no. They needed to make fear so widespread the object of control that everybody was going to comply. And it was, we're going to make people afraid of something you can't see that anyone might have regardless if they have symptoms or not. And we're then going to put an object on your face that by definition makes you more submissive, more afraid, harder to communicate, harder to sympathize, and easier to control. It's remarkable. That's why I believe this is being organized on a supernatural level. Because I don't think these people are that smart. I don't. I think, that, I, think they're being, I think they're pawns in a supernatural Amen. game. Absolutely. And so Fauci, unelected, unknown, unchecked powers, fourth branch of government, no cross-examination, separation of powers, checks and balances, consent to the governed. We never voted for any of that, yet there he is. And so all of a sudden they make him disappear. Why? 
Well, again, here's a little crumb of optimism. It's because I believe in the laws of nature and nature's God, and so do all of you. Amen. And I believe for every action, there's an equal and opposite reaction, and you all believe that. And I believe that the over-accelerated, zealous push by these internationalist globalists to try to destroy your way of life almost overnight is rapidly being met with an equal and opposite reaction that is shaking the ground of which the globalists are on. That's right. And Fauci went from hero to all of a sudden liability overnight. And now this is something I always try to, I, I have these public service announcements I do in my podcast and my radio show. I try to warn the leftist, which is they will come for you. Yeah. Like re, as soon as you're not useful, they'll indict you. They'll throw you away. They'll do whatever they possibly can. It's all a transactional game to them. They don't That's believe right. in loyalty. They don't believe in actual friendship. They believe in power. Fauci He's no longer useful. So they just displace him. All of a sudden, Fauci went from a hero to now, do not be surprised, at a whisper and a leaking campaign in the coming weeks or months, because it's already started, of internal people that are allowed to be platformed in the New York Times, of how Fauci went too far. It went to his head. He became a narcissist, where they're going to try to all of a sudden, all of a sudden try to sober the image of Fauci. Because if... Things come out that are so bad, which I believe exist in the internal documents, the NIH, they want to be able to have the escape hatch to put them out to pasture right. and be like, oh, no, no, we told you so. Fauci was actually bad news, and we hope you're still wearing your mask or whatever, right? <laughs> and so he's not there because he became a liability very quickly because they're very worried that normal people are rising up. It's exactly correct. We've seen this happen before. It's, it's the, right out of the playbook of those that would use our freedoms and our liberties to advance their purposes and causes. It's remarkable to think. Many of us in this room, if not all of us, have the concept or the sense or the feeling that we're about bettering the country and leaving it to our kids and our grandkids, and it's something better. Charlie said it earlier. They believe that what they're doing is for the better, but they are the gods right. of their actions. Versus you and I believe that we ought to love one another and that we are to willfully give and exchange and treat and care for one another. They look at it differently. They don't see that inside of man there is this, we've got to, the few of us, the elite, we've got to impose this new worldview right. on, on how it goes. And this is what happens when you have a mind and a life that is void of the presence of God. Amen. You don't, in your mind, you don't answer to God. The Bible is a book of myths. Uh, it's all a story. Uh, it goes back to where, um, I'm drawing a blank right now. Was it, was it Marx or Stalin that said that religion is the opiate Marx. of the people? Marx. Yeah. And they believe that. Same kind of demonic doctrine. That's exactly right. Yeah, there's no doubt about that. Well, so, can, I, can I just please. add one thing onto that, which I think is important, which is when you look at these people, they, they're, they have a different answer to a very basic question, which is what is a human being? So if you ask an average college kid, what is a human being, they'll laugh at you, right? They've never been asked that question. But that's actually one of the most important questions you can ask mm. a fourth grader or a fifth grader. Is a human being just material? Is it just deoxyribonucleic acid and a bunch of cells? Or is it also a soul? It's a big question, yeah. right? Well, if you believe the human being has a soul, then your entire worldview changes immediately. That's right. But they don't believe that. They think it's all just a bunch of material reality. Therefore, they want to try to control that material reality. You see, if you, if you deduce down what these people believe, and again, there have been so many authors that wrote this and warned about this, Nietzsche and so many others, they, they base, it basically comes to this, which is, as soon as you don't believe in a god, then basically all you have is, I'm stronger than you, it's a power hierarchy, love is nothing more than a power hierarchy, music is nothing more than a power hierarchy, and I'm going to keep you in the headlock because it's better that I'm in control and you are not. And I know this is so hard for you to kind of like process, a lot of Christians, because it's so different than how you view the world, but this is how the people in charge view things. This is how Justin Trudeau views the world, for example. Unbelievable. He views it as, I'm in charge and you are not, and if you get in the way of my power, I'm going to go deploy the Canadian state troopers to go after peaceful truckers, drag them through the streets, have horses run them over, close down their bank accounts, and threaten them with a decade in prison. Meanwhile, BLM burned down 30 churches in the summer of 2020. So that question is really important, which is, what is a human being? So we believe that human beings are made in the image of God. We believe we are all made in the image of God. Yeah. Now, what does that mean? That means we're the speaking beings. 
In the two creation stories in the Bible, Genesis 1 and John 1, it says the exact same thing, but it says it differently, which is that God spoke things into existence. Right. God is a speaker. God speaks at Jeremiah 29, 7. He speaks to his people. So our ability to speak is the logos. In the beginning was the word, the word was God, and the word was with God. And this is very important because when we look at John 1, that word logos is rational speech. That's right. So we believe the way to settle our differences, to live, is through dialogue, through speech. They believe the only way to live is through two things, power and pleasure. That's it. Who's in charge and does it make you feel good? Who's in charge and does it make you feel good? Now, if that depresses you, it should, because an entire generation is ingesting that every single day. And that's why we have the most depressed, suicidal, alcohol-addicted, drug-addicted, anxious generation in history. Because all they're told to care about is, what's your status in that company? And are you enjoying yourself? How big is your home? And what kind of drugs are you doing? When those two things, power and pleasure, are all that matters, you create a very dark society. That's and then, right. do not be surprised when people try to go deeper into the darkness. That's right. Because like, you know what, I'm going to get happy as soon as I can control Ukraine. Then I'm going to get happy. Or I'm going to get happy as soon as I get Taiwan. They're going to keep going because it's all about power and pleasure. For us, it's the exact opposite. And that is that supernatural, eternal battle that's playing out in real time. That's exactly right. A narcissistic uh, mindset is exactly that. To, even, even if it's on a, a, a micro scale, if I can control you, manipulate you, there's you know, very horribly bad relationships where somebody in the relationship is, is that type of individual, a narcissistic person where they're putting you down. They're always got to be doing this. First of all, that always comes from a very insecure, inadequate human being who projects themselves that way. Think of people that you might know. Think of Vladimir Putin. Think of those do, that do the bombacity. They're, they're controlling, and they're trying to get you under their thumb and manipulate you. When they do that, they feel powerful. And when you think about how Satan is, did not Satan in the Bible lust and, and drool over power? He said, I want to be like the most high God. I want the angels of heaven to worship me. And what did he do? When Jesus shows up on earth on his redemptive mission to, to have his date at the cross for our sins, Satan tried to derail it right at the beginning by saying, just bow down and worship me and I'll give you all the kingdoms of the earth. Narcissistic attitudes are power-hungry tyrants. They're very shallow, very shallow. So he showed the picture of Klaus Schwab, and there's another picture for real. He with, wears with the a space suit. Yeah, it's the weirdest thing. It's not a joke. He wears a spacesuit with a big medallion. He I, looks like he's I'm right you, out of a Bond villain. Bond movie. <laughs> I have. Now, I don't have to meet the man. I don't want to. He's a narcissist. Projecting an image like that? But see, as believers, we look at the stuff that's going on around the world, and we can say, my Bible talked about that. My Bible talked about that. My Bible talked about that. And that causes you to be bold, not afraid. It causes you to see things that the world cannot see. And look at what COVID did. There are people that you knew. You were friends. And the news was reported, and they completely went crazy on it. And you couldn't figure out what's... Is there something wrong with me? How come I'm not afraid? What's going on here? And things were, like Charlie said, supernaturally challenged, remarkably. Yeah, and so, Jack, I want to go through some of these and kind of have you walk through some of the biblical references. But the one I really want to focus on in particular is the Western values, right? So it says here in number seven, Western values will have been tested to their breaking point. If we could put the list up again, I think some people were taking pictures. This is a reference we could put up for yep. a second. But Western values, what are Western values? Well, Western values are an extension of the Judeo-Christian construct, specifically of Christian New Testament teaching. Western values is a belief in God-granted natural rights, in separation of powers, in consent of the governed. Western values does, rejects this idea that a singular individual has a mandate to rule without any question over you. Uh, so the Western values is the fruits of the Enlightenment blended correctly with the truths of the Bible and things from antiquity. Yeah. That, that Western values is why we are able to have the technological advancements, the medical advancements, the communication advancements that we enjoy. But more than anything else, Western values, this right here, what they say, this is code. 
Western values? No, no, no. They're really saying biblical values. That's you understand exactly that? it. Okay? Because they, they know that if they put biblical values on the website, boom, okay, then everyone would be talking about it. That's but right. But Western values, like, okay, yeah, whatever. Like, that sounds like something in a college course. What they're trying to say is they're going to try to break, by 2030, biblical values. Yep. So more specifically, they want to break every single one of the Ten Commandments. Every single one. Okay, let's, let's play that out. Like, Charlie, you, know, you might be exaggerating. What did you open this with? The smash and grab? Thou shall not steal. Exactly. Right? Yeah. Thou shall not covet. Oh, well, that's, that's pretty easy. That's right. How about this? Is there, is there, is there not a concerted effort to try to break the bond between parents and children right now? Of course. On steroids. You cannot have a great reset if parents have strong bonds with their children. That is the only commandment that comes with a promise and involves your nation. It's the only commandment because it says, honor your mother and father so that you might live long in the land of which you are in. Promise and yep. your nation. How about not murdering? Do, do I have to go any further into what's happening exactly. in abortion? Exactly. They are doing everything they possibly can to break the Ten Commandments. And it's broader than that, but I think that's a good way to kind of frame it. Because the ten, I believe the Ten Commandments Absolutely. is just a really good starting point in more ways than one. Um, as far as just how you order society, and I think they are, I mean, they're, they're, they're beyond morally, tran they are morally transcendent. And every person who, who lives them out will be individually, you know, flourishing and grow closer to God. But they, when they say they want to break those, mm -hmm. they're going to try to do it not just through the laws, but also through, through trying to make it acceptable and, in fact, glorify it, right? So let's use, let's use another example, right? So it says, you know, shall not commit adultery, right? Um, and so, you know, you can, you can look at the Hebrew, um, and basically you could expand it. It depends on how you look at it, sexual immorality or whatever. It is now mainstream to try to glorify what I call sexual anarchy in today's time. Right? You can do whatever you want to do, whenever you want to do it, however you want to do it. And so I just wanted to focus on that one, Jack, and, and expand on what the, the well, scriptures warn us about with this. Listen, I love the fact that, and I was going to say it, and you jumped out there. Western values, Western values, Western values. He's exactly correct. Listen, the West did not create these values. There are biblical values, let's be more geographically specific, from the Middle East, right? From Israel from the God of Israel, these values, Western values, no, no, no. It's the West that adopted those values. Any nation in the world, any continent, any family, any person can adopt those values. But the West adopted those values. The West chose to do that. How did it choose? Like the Enlightenment, Reformation period, evangelism. Our, our founding fathers believed the scriptures and made sure that the First Amendment was the First Amendment and the Second Amendment was the Second Amendment because they understood two things. That no matter what laws you pass, God has put it within a human being to speak his mind. And you can't outlaw that. That's Our right. founding fathers knew that. Number two is that you must recognize that a family will do everything it can to protect itself against destruction from an outsider or from an invader. The right to bear arms. Don't think about a gun. You know, people, guns, guns. The reason why it's the Second Amendment is because it's a biblical fact that the Bible says, for example, if a man does not provide for his home, he's worse than a non-believer. That's not money. That's safety, protection, love, care. And so it's not a gun issue. It's a rock issue, a stone issue. It's you coming to uh, rape my wife. It, now it's a fist issue or whatever I can grab. I'll are you hearing me? This is within the human heart and soul. Everybody knows it. Even the most progressive liberal that might be in the house tonight or viewing, they know it. That if you push too far, you're going to get smacked down. Western values are really the, is that exactly what Charlie said? Biblical worldview values. How are they destroyed? Summing up what he just said. Isaiah said it. It's repeated in the New Testament. Good must be called evil. That's exactly right. Evil must be called good. Yes. That's how you flip a Western or biblical culture. That's so true. Okay? Um, where do you want to jump in? Uh, I want to do another one here, which Let's pops out at people. Uh, you'll own nothing and you'll be happy, right? Yeah. So th this is really important. The first real estate deal ever done in the history of the world recorded was Abraham yep. going down to Hebron and buying a plot of land 
to be able to bury himself and bury his future generations. First real estate deal that we know. And God never condemns owning property. In fact, he encourages being able to own property and to be able to trade in multiple times throughout the scriptures, parable of the talents and other things. Now, why is private property so important to freedom? It's very, it's very simple. Look at Canada. If you do not have the ability to protect your own stuff, then it's not yours. They take it. It's the states and the governments. So let's just look, let's look at the Canadian example, right? Right across the border. We don't like your politics. We don't like your worldview. Your bank account is gone. What does that mean? That means your time is gone. That means your investments are gone. That means all of your hours you worked at work gone instantaneously. Private property is a stop sign and a do not enter sign for a tyrant to be able to get into your business. You cannot be free without private property. You cannot. It's impossible. Every common That's denominator right. of a totalitarian dictatorship first gets rid of some form of private property. Like, oh, no, no, you can't own oil wells in Venezuela. That's how they started. Then they're like, you can't have more than one restaurant in Cuba. That's what they said. We don't, have, we don't want to have people owning too many restaurants. Or you can't be too rich or too wealthy. And eventually, of course, it goes down to, we're just going to confiscate all your stuff, especially if you don't like what you have. But this is what the creepy part of this is, is that you'll own nothing, but then you'll also be happy. That's like the creepier part of the statement, that is, that's right? That's exactly right. Which, I don't know about you, is, sounds like really like hypnotic, as if like either you're going to, oh, like we're going to force you, like you're happy, right? I, yes, I'm so happy, super happy, thanks for asking. Like, thank you, <laughs> very happy. And this is why I think the yeah. number one is worth kind of dwelling on and exploring. Absolutely. Is it's unbelievably totalitarian. It's like, you're going to tell me I'm going to be happy? Like, hold on a second. No. Like, you have no, deter you have no determination over my happiness at all whatsoever. Okay? Yeah. And the fact you're going to command me to first own nothing and I'll like it, and you're going to tell me I'm going to like it, I think just goes to show exactly who they think they are. They look at you as nothing more than little, little checkers on the, on, on the board or pieces on the chess piece. Like, no, no, you're going to like it. We're going to tell you that you're going to like it. And so um, this is important in a lot of different ways. I can go into, Jack, how they're breaking private property apart, which I think is also instructive. But that one right there is the one that, that is going to lead to a lot of the economic conditions of the Great Reset. Allow me to put the Bible uh, app on this. And it the, the scripture speaks about private ownership throughout the scripture. Abraham owned land. He owned cattle. He, he had sheep. Ownership. You cannot have biblical stewardship, which you and I are going to be judged on before the day of Christ. When we, the believers, stand before the Lord, notice one of the things that we're going to be judged on when Jesus examines the believer's life. What were we faithful or how were we faithful with what he gave us uh, to own? Did we use it and keep it for ourselves or did we multiply it and make it useful to others? Many times Jesus speaks in the New Testament, even through parables, that a man had land and he had to harvest and he went out and hired others to come and work his fields. Understand this. The Great Reset is against all that. They want to own everything that you have. It's not the fact that they own so much themselves. They want to be that godlike entity that makes you the peasant. But know this, by the way. There's a lot of people in the young generation. They don't believe that they need to make a profit. They don't believe That's that right. they, they don't believe that because they think it's greedy. Let me, let me give you a little bit of smelling salts right now <laughs> on, on this one. When it comes to needs and acts of benevolence, the United States is the most generous nation, and it has been for over 90 years. When something happens in the world, the United States responds, and with the biggest. All right? Even right now, the amount of money, which is kind of spooky, the amount of money that's being flooded into Ukraine right now by, by well-meaning Christians, you don't know where it's going. We did that in Haiti. We're doing it again. Be careful. Watch out. But the point is this. Private ownership is not only mentioned in scripture, it's taught and God's going to judge us someday as to what did we do with what we had. That's right. And he never, listen, he never says that poverty is a virtue. Think about that. How are you going to feed people that can't make it? It's the middle class that feeds people who can't make it. And listen, have you ever worked and succeeded working for a poor man? I haven't. 
You don't work for poor people. You work for people who are succeeding. And God says, if you're faithful in a little bit, I'll make you faithful in more. The issue comes down to what are you doing with what you have? And it's that individual's business to do whatever they want to do with what they have. But it's not to take it away and give it to Hillary Clinton. It's not to redistribute the wealth like Barack Obama wants us to do. You think about that for a moment. And that's one of the reasons why people are still trying to break into this country. It's the place that is still a beacon of hope. But know this, private ownership. And another thing, you talked about creepy. Here's what's creepy. The spirit that says, which is behind all that stuff about be happy that you have nothing, (laughs) is the spirit that says, if you were really a Christian, you'd you'd get vaccinated and get masked and just go stay indoors. In fact, you showed, did you show it on the pastor's link or, or whatever that clip was where in the airport? That lady said, oh, those, I wish all those Christians would just drop dead. Yep. Yeah. Think about that. That kind of creepy talk is, again, I think, of a, of a spirit of a demonic origin. That's exactly that right. if you Christians really love people, you would, you would put on your mask or you'd take your shot. And, and, and so who are, excuse me, pull down your mask. Who are you saying this? Can I see you? What are you talking about? Are you a Christian? Oh, I'm a Christian. I mean, you just have noticed the strange things that have been said. It makes no sense. We used to live in a country. If you want to wear a mask, wear a mask. Some people should wear masks. Listen, if, if, you, don't, if you don't want to wear a mask, then you don't have to wear a mask. Or the shot. I'm, uh, you have to take the shot. I don't have to take the shot. No, you have to take the shot. Did you take the shot? I took the shot. Then if you took the shot, then I don't need to take the shot because you took it. See, now that, what I just said, if I were in Canada right now, I wouldn't be able to leave the country. That's right. I just broke a major Trudeau... Thought crime. Thought crime. That's right. By the way, the guy's never been strong on anything. Until his authority got tampered with. That's right. And then he went ballistic. That, that's, that's a characteristic of a tyrant. Yeah. There's other characteristics too that, that give vulner, vulnerabilities. Other one I want to talk about, Jack, we've touched on this, um, is the U.S. won't be the world's superpower. Then I want to get into the meat one because you have an interesting verse on that, which I think is just interest, really important. <laughs> so I'm going to touch a little bit on the U.S. one. Um, and, and Jack, you said this earlier, which is, look, our, our founding is exceptional. The founding fathers, they understood human nature. So I asked earlier, what is a human being? Right? It's a body, it is a soul, and it is a mind. Just like the Trinity, made in the image of God. Exactly. Right? And we also believe, though, that human beings are naturally programmed, because of original sin, to be, um, to be more, than, more than not just likely, but we are going to mess up, especially if we get into positions of power. Yeah. And so the founding fathers understood human nature to such a great extent that they had to create a system of checks and balances, separation of powers, that tries to diffuse that. And local government was one of the ways they put that into place. But America is such a unique project in human history. It is so exceptional to have citizen-led government, not subject government, not serf government, not slave government, but citizen government, which comes from a Greek word, co-ruler, and that as soon as America stops being the world's superpower, then all of a sudden all these other things start to become possible. And America has made plenty of foreign policy mistakes. I totally admit that. However, we are the only benevolent superpower ever to exist in the history of the world. Never before has a country had as much wealth, power, generosity as America and has used it all of the assets we have at our disposal for good. I want you to think about that. What would China do? What will China do? What is China doing with power and wealth? They helping the disadvantaged overseas? No, they're supporting the invasion. That's right. What does China do with power? They suppress their citizens. There's a great quote by Aristotle which says that power shows the man. If you want to find out who someone is, give them a lot of power for a day, you'll find out everything you need to know about them. So true. Everything you need to know. I want to know about this guy. Okay, make him in charge of that branch for one day of that restaurant, or that, and you'll find out everything you need to know. 
having people take knees, you know, whatever. It's like, okay, that guy should be nowhere near power. He's a narcissist, sociopath, all of that. America passed the power test. We're the only major country ever to pass the power test. What did Rome do when they had power? They enslaved half the Western world, right? What did Greece do? Kept on declaring wars. The United, you know, Great Britain, you know, had plenty of problems uh, in, in the imperial setting. But America passed the power test yeah. despite all of our problems. That's right. And why? Well, it, a lot of different reasons. First, we had an active and vibrant church that always kept the American moral conscious in check, mm-hmm. which I think we took for granted. Our documents, our people, our history, our heritage. But also, Jack, you know, I say this, and I come under great criticism. Uh, I believe that America has been given an extra dose of grace by God. I really believe this. Oh, absolutely. I, and I believe that, that... That's mildly said, Charlie. And... To whom much is given, much is required. That's right. And so, you know, I want to make sure we get our words specific here, which is that people say America's a gift, and I understand that sentiment. But it's more like America was an investment, and I'll prove it to you. You probably don't remember what you got for Christmas three years ago. Gifts are usually forgotten quickly, except the gift of Christ, which of course is not. But investments, when God invests in you or invests in his people, Mm. that comes with a set of obligations. Very different. Gifts can be discarded. Okay, Uncle Ricky gave you a banjo. Like, okay, whatever. But when someone invests time in you or money in your company, it comes with a set of obligations and standards. Like, hey, you better come back in two weeks, and if I find out that you're still drinking or whatever, I'm not going to pay your rent. Like, okay, I got it. There's, there's, there's a check and balance there. I think America's no different. I really do. And so if that were to be by 2030, and we won't be the world's superpower... Let's just talk about this from Christian terms. The gospel will be under attack like we have not seen oh, yes. in well over, in my opinion, a thousand years. Yeah. I think it would be the greatest persecution of Christians that we have seen in probably 30 generations. Mm-hmm. And so there's a reason why they put that there. Because Satan, the enemy, would love nothing more than the beacon of goodness to try to go out. That shining city of it on a hill to go out. And darkness would flow across Isn't the world. Re- it's remarkable, Charlie, with all... Now, look, obviously, there's no nation on earth that's perfect, and we get it, and America's got her problems. But isn't it interesting that one of their agenda items is that America will not be the world's superpower? It's so insistent, right? They say right? out of lust. Like, yes. I want that. We want that's that. That's so smart. And there's just such an envy in that statement. And yet, um, it's probably much of America that empowered these people. You talk about the Gates... The Bezos. That's what's so Isn't amazing. Isn't it weird? It's like eating the very thing that gave you life. It's if, if very there, demonic. If, there was, if only there was a Bible story about that, right? Yeah, exactly. Or two or yeah. three or uh, 200. Exactly. Right? Being exactly. ungrateful and rebelling against your creator, right? Remarkable. Remarkable. Um, it's called the Old Testament, by the way, just so we're clear, okay? <laughs> Where are we on this list? So, uh, let's do the meat one. I think that's, I think that's an interesting one. The uh, first or second Timothy? Um... It's 1 Timothy, if I remember right, chapter 4. Now the Spirit expressly says that in the latter times some will depart from the faith, giving heed to deceiving spirits and doctrines of demons, speaking lies and hypocrisy, and having their own conscience seared with a hot iron, forbidding to marry and uh, commanding to abstain from foods which God created to be received with thanksgiving by those who, have, who, who believe and know the truth. For every creature of God uh, is good, and nothing is to be uh, refused uh, if it is received with thanksgiving. For it is sanctified by the word of God and by prayer. We were talking... Less that, meat. Less, yes, the meat issue. Um, no meat. Uh, less meat. What's the argument for that? Uh, why are they making this one of the important things? What's, what's the facet to this? What's the dynamic to this? Um, know this, that God's word says that there's going to be those that say that in the last days that there is a, a manifestation or a display of righteousness if you don't eat meat. I'm not knocking if you're a vegetarian. That's not what we're talking about here. But the scripture says that everything that God has given in that chapter has been given for you to eat and to enjoy and to give thanks to God for. But why in the world, Charlie, do they have this, this as one of their important topics that it would be a meatless world? Well, first, let me just say, this is how you know the Bible is true, that one of the last things that Paul writes you know, to young Timothy about the end times, he's talking about people not going to be eating the things of the earth. I mean, that's awfully specific. Like, that's a big gamble. 
right? And it's like, boom, right yeah. there. They're yeah. predicting it. It's just it's the brilliance of the Bible. It's just so unbelievably beautiful. The argument they make for no meat, I know this is going to make people laugh, um, is the, um, the gas that cows let off, uh, the, um, is the methane from cows. I'm not kidding. It's a very real thing. Um, they're not totally wrong, honestly. Cows do let off a lot of methane. Um, do I think that is contributing to the downfall of environmental stasis? Absolutely not. I think it's insane. Um, so yeah, cow farts they think are ending humanity. So um, I'm not kidding. No, it's not a joke. It's, it's a very real thing. You could look at their literature. You could look it up. Um, and therefore, they want to try to wean the human species off of meat um, because they think that, and, and this is a different environment, this is a different religion, right? Which, there you go. Which is that in the beginning of the Bible, it is a, the most clear and concise repudiation of secular environmentalism. Mm. That we must take dominion of the earth, that it's there for us, that we should give thanks for it, but it's there so that humans can flourish. They do not believe that. They believe that nature and human beings are equals, and at times, they believe na nature yes. is supreme and superior. That's right. And so they believe that, that there's two components of it, that eating an animal is a moral injustice, but a lot of them actually don't believe that. They'll say that the animals themselves letting out the methane gas while they're eating grass is hurting the environment, and we humans are so dirty and awful. Remember, we're just material. We're not a soul. We're not, we That's have no right. spirit, right? That's right? So we got to get rid of them. This is why, and we probably should have mentioned this, but... There is a stated goal by some members, not the World Economic Forum, by some members of the World Economic Forum to reduce global population from 7 billion to 100 million people. Okay? That, that, that is a stated goal, not of the World Economic Forum itself, but some of the members. And Bill Gates has danced in those circles. That's he, right. He hasn't said that explicitly, but he's entertained that idea of intentional depopulation. Okay? You can look at that very clearly. And... And by the way, what else was in that prophecy, Jack, was that people weren't going to marry? Is that, is that correct? Forbidding to marry, forbidding to eat meat. Isn't that interesting? We're, oh. we, marriage rates are down. We're on a verge of a population collapse. All simultaneously so, when this is happening. You know what that means after service tonight, right? You're going you're gonna, to you're gonna go out and get married and celebrate at In-N-Out Burger. <laughs> right? By the way... How awesome was In-N-Out Burger on the vaccine issue? Wasn't that amazing? Yes, what absolutely. They did? Wasn't that awesome? It was phenomenal. Yep, yep. And so, uh, where are we on this? A billion people will be displaced because of climate change. Um, is the climate changing? I know the climate well, ebbs and flows. We know from archaeological so, and, and uh, ice age data. Yeah, it ebbs and flows. Look, so I do believe that people will be displaced. I don't think it's going to be because of climate change, and the Bible actually talks about you know, massive people displacement. But look, the, the climate change debate is such a disingenuous debate. It is. Because if they actually believed in it, which they, it, it, which they don't, they would want natural gas, which is incredibly environmentally efficient, and they'd also be open to nuclear energy, which they're not, of course. No. Um, but they can't answer the three most important questions of climate change, right? Which is, okay, um, how much are human beings contributing? So that if the climate is changing and temperatures are going up, how much is it human beings? Like, oh, we don't know that. Oh, you don't know how much it's human? So is it 1%, half of 1%, 5%, 10%? Are there any other external contributing factors? Like, okay, that's the first question. The second question when it comes to climate change, that if human beings are contributing, what could be done to actually lower it? Right? That's an interesting question, right? Which is, okay, if America decides to stop using coal-powered coal powered fire, uh, cold fire power plants, but China builds 20 new ones, same planet, same earth, does it really make that big of a difference, right? They can't answer that. And then the third thing, which is the most important question, which is how you know you're dealing with an adult versus a child. <laughs> and this is, this is a Dennis Prager quote, which God bless Dennis Prager. It's very simple. Yeah. Which is, adults ask the question, what's the cost? Children never ask those questions. That's so true. what's the cost? Okay, so we embrace this climate change thing. We're all in. We're putting our climate change super suit on, right? What's the cost? Well, Putin's going to try to take Ukraine. That's a big cost. What's the cost? Well, poor people in India won't be able to have hospitals powered because solar panels aren't able to deliver that kind of energy reliably. That's, right. That's a cost. 
So you could read all the climate change literature and it all comes down to one very, very basic thing that we know about the world. That we should try to get the world's poorest people access to the cheapest energy as quickly as possible to break out of their state of poverty. That's it. That is an, ir that is an irrefutable fact. Is that we should try to get the world's poorest people mm -hmm. the cheapest energy so they can break out of their state as quickly as possible. And it's so easy, everybody, That's for true. us in our Western country That's to right. just give lectures about solar panels and Tesla and all of this, where you're talking about countries like Vietnam, Laos, and Cambodia, and the Philippines, and India, where they have hundreds of millions of people that are running waters and toilets, where they're just trying to build regular grids that work in schools and hospitals, and you're trying to lecture them about carbon emissions? Exactly. Like, they're trying to get their life expectancy above 50 for right. entire cities and entire provinces. And so we, from a Christian standpoint, should say, okay, God gave us fossil fuels to be able to flourish and to make dominion over the earth. And if that can extend the life expectancy of our fellow humans halfway across the world, why would we try to, why would you try to forsake that? But, but if you don't believe there is a God and you believe you That's are God it. and you believe human beings are just clumps of cells and not mind, body, and spirit, then why wouldn't you depopulate to 100 million people? Because you'd worship the earth and you'd be in control. He was amazing. I, I grew up in Southern California and born in San Diego. And uh, that was 64 years ago. So I remember, do you guys remember if you grew up here, uh, smog, smog alerts? Do you remember when you couldn't go outside of your school classroom? Do you remember there was no football games or baseball games after school canceled because of the air? Do you remember your lungs burning and you were in the sixth grade from running? That's all gone now. That doesn't happen anymore. You got to remember that. Technology, advancement. In fact, we've got at least double the amount of population here now. That's right. That's the legal ones. <laughs> right? And, and we, we have crystal clear skies. We have crystal clear skies. What's going on? These are, I, I see so many of these, these things of fear mongering people yes. into control. So, Jack, uh, in the time we have remaining, I did tease the hope. So I, I do want people to leave, leave a little bit optimistic. Is that, is that okay? Yeah. Do you guys want to leave a little bit optimistic? Is that okay? So um, I, I just want to talk a little bit about how I think all of this is kind of being put into jeopardy. If you guys want to be totally, like, sullen and sad, like, we'll leave it at that. But um, so, <laughs> so look, um, we're dealing with a group of people that believe they're God, and I believe in the Genesis 11 principle, which is that anyone that tries to build anything to challenge God's authority, God will scatter into confusion and into chaos. That is the Genesis 11 principle, right? I believe that is true today, I believe it's true tomorrow, and I believe that is an eternal That's right. truth. That's right. How, and, but I want to just, I want to encourage all of you right now. And I, I, Jack, I listen every single week, I listen to Pastor Rob, I listen to you guys, and I just love it. Uh, and I just want to say, you guys are so blessed to have Jack Hibbs as your pastor. He does such an unbelievable job. I mean that. I mean that. This guy is one of the best Bible teachers in the country. And his, his stamina is unbelievable, right? I mean, he just produces and produces. It's just incredible. And I really look up to you, Jack. I mean that. And so, um, you know, I want to say that I spoke here back on January 21st of last year, the day after the inauguration. And you guys were really sad. <laughs> and I was too. <laughs> However, I remember being backstage and I had to force myself to try to come at you guys with optimism and with energy mm. and with positivity. Now, many of the predictions we made back then came true, right? Unfortunately, some of them also came true of kind of the country falling apart, right? But what I just want to say, and I, I kind of, I, I spoke at like 20 churches in like 30 days, and we traveled the country, and I really challenged you guys. And I could say, just based on the emails and the messages I've received from so many of these people, you guys took my message and Jack's message and a message similar to that, so to heart, and it was a challenge of, hey, mm. go be a citizen and not a subject. Yes. Go make the next year yeah, about a year yeah. of action. So let's go, let, let, let's look what happened in this last year. In this last year, where you guys could have gave up, where you saw what you're up against with Klaus Schwab, World Economic Forum, Bill Gates, mandatory vaccines, mass ma mandates and all this, you guys went to work. You guys started showing up at school board meetings all, all across this area. <laughs> you guys started to ask yeah. questions. You guys started to run for school board. The American homeschooling population quadrupled That's in right. the last year. <laughs> by four. That's a threat to the Great Reset, by the way. 
That is a direct threat to the Great Reset, when parents start to get back into taking ownership of the education. We started to see school boards flip. That's right. We saw the news of what happened in Virginia. We saw what happened in New Jersey. We're not just the political side of it, but all of a sudden we started to see, and we're living through it right now, the rise of the citizen. We're all of a sudden, the plumbers, the electricians, the police officers, the teachers, the people that otherwise were on the sidelines, they're getting into the game. This is no longer where I'm telling you, you guys got to do it. You are doing it. I'm getting more messages than I could be. People running for office, people getting signatures, people showing up to meetings, people filling FOIA requests, churches doing this amazing thing. And Jack, you've been such a leader in this capacity. It is, I got to be honest with the work we're doing at Turning Point USA, we are overwhelmed by the amount of students, by the amount of people and parents that are getting involved on a daily basis. We are overwhelmed. And by the way, we have, we have some of our Turning Point USA students here somewhere. I, don't, I think they're right over Turning here. Point. Give it up for our Turning Point USA students. They do such a great job. And so to, to put all this together is that the World Economic Forum, the Leonardo DiCaprio, the Bill Gates, all these people, they thought in January of last year, if they called you insurrectionists, mm -hmm. if they sent the Department of Justice after moms and dads, if they wrote memos, from the Attorney General, that they could metaphorically break your will by blitzkrieging you into surrender. Mm. They actually thought this. They, they thought that after COVID and the deterioration of the currency and the mask mandates and all of this, that you would sue for peace. That was their plan. And that was a really dumb plan. <laughs> they thought that you were gonna give up and you're like, okay, I, I got it, fine. Mitt Romney be in charge of our movement, we're done, like no more. <laughs> and so many of you were like, you know what, I've had it. I want to do more than just watch Tucker Carlson, God bless him every night, buy the pillow and hope things get better, right? <laughs> I want to do more. And by the way, promo code Kirk at mypillow.com. The slippers are unbelievable. They're the greatest slippers ever. I have to. I have to tell you. These are dream sheets. Ten I, out of ten. I bought. I bought my pillow when nobody knew who Mike Lindell <laughs> was. I still have my pillow. In about an hour, I'll be with my pillow again. There you go. And it's the best. Promo code Kirk. No, but um, all of a sudden, you guys did what you weren't supposed to do. That's right. You participated. Those of you that gave money. Those of you that showed up in a glitch in the matrix. And now the Klaus Schwab's, the World Economic Forum types, don't know which way to look That's because right. they're like, wait a second, these people that are supposed to be meatless and super happy about owning nothing and America falling apart is they're righteously angry, yes. yet they're still happy because they believe in something we don't and they're about to displace us from power and they're super That's worried exactly about right. it. That's exactly right. That's exactly right. Exactly right. And so, how, how do you push back against it? You already are. Do more of it. Keep organizing. Stay optimistic. Keep learning. Keep homeschooling your kids. It's, believe that victory is in our sights because it is. Because the people that are in charge, the World Economic Forum, the Davos types, is that that's all they have. Their strategy is super simple. Break it, reset it. Break it, reset it. Okay, well, you're not going to break it on our watch. So what else you got? Because we're going to restore this. That's right. In fact, we're going to be stronger than ever. More people are rising up than we've ever seen. So it's That's a so message true. of optimism, Jack, is that the pe I know it's really scary when you go through this. Like, ew, 2030. Like, hey, we have truth on our side. Amen. Like, we have the people on our side. And we're starting to see a movement of citizens, Jack, that will just defy historical proportions. Well, and, and Charlie, here's the thing that's almost funny, and I, I don't laugh because I, I want to appear to be respectful, but um, they have set their, their goal date. They have said, we're going to do this by 2030. Yes. It reminds me of Psalm chapter 2. The Lord looks down from heaven and he laughs. He laughs yes. at the antics of man. And it's quite remarkable. You have to remember this. The word of God, this is not the first generation that has challenged the word of God. It's been challenged since the Garden of Eden. Amen. And God has had an answer. He will always have an answer. And oh, by the way, he doesn't think up the answer when there's a crisis. His answer has always been, it is eternal. And listen, 
We are not inviting you tonight to join this church or some religion. The happy news for you, you can relax, is that we have no membership at this church, so you can't join, okay? We don't want your money. We want you to know God, okay? And, and when that happens in life, when that happens in life, you cannot be controlled by any political party or by what some group determines what they're going to do because they think that they're God's. They're not. That's exactly right. And the scripture says, he who sits in heaven shall laugh. And it's quite remarkable. This is a time for us to be bold. This is a time for us to be strong, not, not arrogant. There's a big difference. That's right. Bold and strong, the believer should be, but never arrogant because our God rules and reigns. And he does that first in our hearts. That's where this all begins. And so you don't need to be afraid about the things that are coming. Yes, the Bible tells you what's coming. I don't know about you, but I don't like the things that I don't know about. That's what I don't like. Yeah. But when somebody comes along and says, oh, this is what we're going to do. If it's a doctor, a contractor, if it's a gardener, it doesn't matter what I like when you're a pilot. I mean, obviously your ticket says Cincinnati on it. I know where I'm going. But the pilot gets on there and he says, hey, you know, welcome. We're going to be leaving L.A. today. I kind of figured that out. We're going to be going to Cincinnati. That's, I bought my ticket for that. We're going to be at 37,000 feet. I don't care. I just know I'm getting from L.A. to Cincinnati. And the beautiful thing about all of this is that God looks down from heaven and he sees all of man's manipulation of things. And everything, they don't even know it. Everything that they're doing is working toward the will of God. And the greatest thing for you to do is to find out what the Bible says. Do not find out what some pastor says or some church denomination is all about. Find out what God's word says. And you know what you'll find out? You'll find out that he loves you. Amen. He, you'll find out that that very thing that you long for that you may not remember is that you need to be forgiven. It clears your mind and your conscience. And you know what? Relieves you of guilt because Jesus took that all for you at the cross. And there's a world that is going exactly according to God's plan. The, the guys up in the, in the Davos and all that, they think they're doing their thing. But he who sits in the heavens shall laugh, says the scriptures. So listen, we need not fear anyone or anything. We need to be busy about our father's business. I hope that you're doing everything you can to get the gospel out to the ends of the earth, but first in your family, okay? And know this, that if tonight you stumbled in here because you heard that the famous and incredibly wonderful and good man he is. Jack Hibbs. Charlie will. <laughs> see? Charlie's the real deal, you guys. But listen, I, I got to tell you. I got to tell you, your hope is the Lord Jesus Christ. He died on the cross for your sins. Love did that. Love for you did that. He rose again from the dead. That's how you're justified. Listen, getting to heaven is not by being religious. It's not by being baptized or sending money in or doing some penance. Thank God that the gospels announce that when the two thieves, the two malefactors, those are bad guys, that were crucified, flanking Jesus on both sides. It's a picture of the world, is it not? Both of them were terribly guilty. Both of them knew it. One died on the cross in his guilt and shame. The other one said, Lord Jesus, will you remember me when you come into your kingdom? What a statement, what a question, what a request. He didn't even say, God, forgive me. Jesus looked into his soul and unpacked what was in that question. And he said, today you'll be with me in paradise. The guy wasn't baptized. He didn't tie the penny. He didn't do anything good. He just recognized who Jesus Christ was. And you can do the same thing tonight. Amen. He's the Lord. He loves you. He rescued from your sins. Charlie, closing words, man. So 
I, I just want to continue to encourage you. Th these guys can be beat, and we are going to beat them. Uh, you know, I, I've dedicated my life and our work at Turning Point USA and our uh, radio program, and thank you guys who listen locally uh, on KTIE. I get these beautiful messages from Jack every so often. Um, <laughs> and on our podcast, I'll, I'll mention that in just a second. Thank you guys for supporting us. I traveled 330 days last year um, to try to spread liberty. It was the hardest working year I've ever had, and I, I felt... I really felt moved to try to do that um, because I felt that this gift of liberty, which is God's idea, not man's idea, was under attack uh, in more ways than one. But I really believe there is a movement of people, of righteous people, of churches and pastors that are rising up in such a historic and amazing way. So Jack, can I just plug one thing? Uh, I do no, this every time it. I'm here. You do guys it. know it. Uh, some of you guys are new, though. Everyone has a smartphone. Uh, we do three podcasts a day. Yes. Jack, you're on a lot. If you guys want to get da daily information that's biblical. Yep. Uh, that is centered on a pro-freedom, pro-liberty message. Uh, we're under cancellation of big tech threats all the time. Um, if you guys would take out your phone and get your podcast app out Please. and just subscribe, it helps us more than I can ever tell you. Jack, when I first plugged it here at this church, it almost tripled our audience, and I could tell you let's it was unbelievable. It. Can't, so let's do it. it would be such a blessing. It's free of charge on the live stream. You take out your phone, Apple Podcast, podcast app. It's Charlie Kirk Show. If you're like, how do I do that? There's an eight-year-old in the audience somewhere that I'm sure it's true. can walk you through that. But it really does bless us. It's free of charge. It's a way to get behind us, um, and I would be greatly appreciative. Final note is this, is fight. Just keep on fighting for what is right, everybody. What we just went through tonight... Yep. is not set in stone. It's eventually going to happen, but we, we have to push back against it as much as we can in our lifetime yeah. in every way possible. Get to know Jesus and make him known. And Jack, I just love coming to this church, and I consider you guys some of my closest friends. Absolutely. So God bless you guys. We Thank love you having so you, Charlie. Love having you. Love having you. Let's, let's, we'll stand there. Yeah. Thank you, guys. So you guys... You guys, listen, hang on for a second. Let's pray. Father, we ask you to bless Charlie, Lord, and we ask you to watch over Turning Point USA. We thank you so much for what you're doing there. And Father God, we pray that you would cause him to be safe as he's on the front lines. And Lord God, that you would keep him humble and usable. I am so glad to report before God and man that since the day I met this young man, he's not changed. He's just done the work. And so, Father, we pray that you would continue to bless him and his health and his precious bride and watch over them. And Father God, that you would promote and advance. And Lord, in Jesus' name, we pray now that the efforts, the, the little efforts, Lord, we come to you tonight with a bag, as it were, of, of fish, Lord, and bread. And we ask you to multiply that. And we pray, Lord, that you would pause, that you'd stop the clock on the deconstruction of the United States of America. I've got grandchildren. I pray that they would grow up in freedom. Lord, I pray that you would move in this nation. And God, that you would shake our foundations and cause that which is from you to remain and that which is not from you to be removed away. Lord, you can do anything. We know prophetically the hour is late, but you're still on your throne. You'll always be on your throne. But Lord, there's still in the United States of America. And God, we pray that you'd send us godly leadership and that you'd, Lord, restore our nation while there's yet time. We thank you for the freedom of worship and the ability to gather tonight. But Father, we ask you now, as we commit Charlie into your care. Keep him safe. Galvanize him, Lord, against the attacks of the enemy. And Father, we just commit him into your hands. In Jesus' name, and all God's people said, amen. amen. God bless you guys. Thank you guys.